All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to 15 and 15. I'm not going to suck up any time, so I'm going to toss it right over to our good friend, Allison Mitchell. Hi. And I already advanced off of my introductory slide. So you're here because you're interested in supporting successful student group work in your classes. And I happen to teach a semester long class in the social work program that is about group work. So seemed like a natural fit. I'm not going to read you the learning objectives this is what I think I'm going to cover. And because we have 15 minutes, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Oh, this is not going to work well. Hold on a second. Of course, we have to have a tech glitch. Uh, I'm not sure why my screen's not advancing well. You will have access to these resources. The handouts are, Martha has linked them. The Lineberry text that's in the middle is an online OER text that actually is a more communication and business oriented, but it's what I use in my social work class, um, just as a tip so that you know there's this whole OER textbook out there on small group communication. And then I use my lectures to make it more social worky. So even though it's not in my discipline, it's really useful. There we go. So some things that I have learned along the way that might be helpful for all of you. First off, there is actually a sweet spot for how many students to have in a group. And part of how we foster effective group work in our classes is we need to do some pre-planning. Um, we need to think carefully as instructors why we're doing it, how we're going to do it. And so part of this pre-planning is thinking a little bit about group size and how you're going to do that. Under three to five, and you tend to have a limited scope of ideas, obviously, greater than three to five, you have much more opportunity for what the technical term is called social loafing. There's actually a technical term for the students who don't pull their weight. <laughs> um, and then we also need to think about how the groups are going to form, whether that's through friendships topic areas of interest or maybe pre-selected groups that we set up as the professors. I'll tell you in my experience, the least effective groups consistently every time are the ones that form through friendship. My experience is that when students choose based on a topic of interest, those are my most high performing groups consistently. When I pre-select groups, um, you know, periodically I'll get an occasional misfit of personality, but that works better than having students choose by friends, friendship, and not really care much about what topic they're doing. So food for thought for you all to think about. Be able to explain, explain clearly why the students are engaging in the group work, what skills and contents they might be learning, how the group projects contribute to the overall course objectives. That seems pretty obvious, but never underestimate the student's inability to make a connection that should seem obvious to us. Um, I write it out in my syllabus and my next slide is an example of how I write it out in my syllabus. And then I'm constantly making those meta big picture connections throughout the semester. And that's a part of our pre-planning is thinking about as we move through the semester, making sure that we're constantly, the way I call it is like, we'll hop up on the balcony and we'll look down at the dance floor a little bit as what we're doing. And I'll talk to the students. Okay, so these are the home skills that you're using right now. And you are in a stage of group development that we call norming, where you're setting up your way of working as an example. Um, and you might be experiencing some conflict right now because of where we are. So that's what we're doing, big picture. And then we'll hop back down on the dance floor and get back into the muck again. And somehow sort of pulling out and making those big picture connections and then jumping in again seems to really make a big difference for the students. Um, and doing it repeatedly. I do it throughout the semester. Um, also, my opinion. Um, take it or leave it for what you want. I feel very strongly that if I am assigning a group project as a part of a class activity, that I will devote some time in class so that the students, I'm asking them to work as groups and I know that I have them all at a specific time. They have no excuse to not be able to meet because they're supposed to be in class. 
So I dedicate time in my syllabus and often it's written out as like group work day. So they know when it's coming. Sometimes it's spontaneous and sometimes it's planned, but for the most part, I plan it through so that they know, and I'm clear, they're going to have to work outside of class, but I give them time in class too. And that sense tends to cut down on some anxieties. So here's an example pulled out of my group working syllabus that I teach in the spring. And I've highlighted the places where I have made explicit in my syllabus some of these concepts that I just talked about. Working in groups of three or four. So I've already set that up and I tell them why. And there's actual research to this. I didn't just sort of pull this out of the air. This is based on research. I tell them what social work competencies they're going to be developing. I also tell them what habits of mind they're using to develop the competencies. And I link that all to the course learning objectives. Um, I make explicit the time dedicated in class. And in this case, it's a collaborative effort with another course and we preform the groups. So all of that set right up before they ever even read the description of what they're doing. Um, and I have found over time um, teaching this course, students respond incredibly well to that. Then we engage in student group pre-planning, and this is one of your handouts. There's a handout that's called uh, Group Work Self-Assessment. The self-assessment I use in the first two weeks of the semester, it kind of depends where, but by class four, I have already handed them the Group Work Self-Assessment. I tell them that we're modeling pre-planning, which is one of the stages of group work. Um, I make it available electronically. I also have some paper copies because some students prefer to do it on paper. And I devote time in class to working individually on creating or responding to that self-assessment document. Again, I make the connections like this is what we're doing and why. Then once I see that most of the class looks like they're pretty done with the sheet, I put them into their groups. And the groups begin the forming process. And again, I make another meta connection on this, taking their individual self-assessments and talking to each other and creating some norms. So I'm facilit facilitating forming and norming. And I tell them that. And then there's accountability built into it in that I ask every group to submit to me one summary document so that I have a summary document of whatever it is that the group agrees. And the biggest thing that I find that this helps to head off is it makes it very, very clear who in the group are work aheaders and who in the group are last minuteers. And I make it very clear and then they have to go, oh, because there's a it's there's a continuum and they have to sort of mark and so there's this visual thing and then they come together as a group of four and they realize they've got like three people who are last minuteers and one who's a work aheader and they're like ooh how are we going to do that but I make them think about that right up front all of that really sets them up for success can we avoid conflict probably not <laughs> and I also make that clear um, and one of the things that really helps when stuff comes up in class and there is conflict is that we can go back to those shared group contracts, if you will, that we created at the beginning of the semester. Sometimes it's just as simple as my reminding the whole class about the focus. Sometimes I need to read explain or be more clear. Sometimes it's the groups needing to do this themselves. So as instructors, this is a place where we have to play with that a little bit, but I cannot emphasize enough the importance of communication. We're trying to teach purposeful communication. This is an opportunity to practice it. Um, and again, in the course that I'm teaching, we talk a lot about what these communication skills look like. So I have a slide later. And if I don't get to all of my information, it's okay. The slides will be available for you because I gave you as instructors some of the coaching skills and things that I would walk through with my students. Um, none of this is particularly rocket science. It's just kind of putting it together in a way that's really intentional and purposeful as we think about how we're going to make these groups work. Remembering always that what we are modeling in our classes is a large group experience. A classroom is a group experience. And so if we think about using ourselves 
as an example of how we can facilitate good group work and make that explicit. Sometimes our students can kind of key in and be like, oh, like even in the class, she's showing us how to be a group. And so now as we work as a smaller group, we can kind of model that. And sometimes those connections are really helpful for students to make too. Sometimes we need to reframe. Sometimes it's helpful to remember that conflict can spur growth and creativity. So instead of being like afraid of conflict, maybe we need to kind of lean into it and see it as a growth opportunity. Again, growth rarely ever feels comfortable. Conflict doesn't feel comfortable. If we're feeling something that's uncomfortable, we tend to call it conflict and shy away from it. So as instructors, if we see that happening, maybe we can reframe it and sort of help the group to see like, hey, this is great. You're doing exactly what I thought you would do. You're growing in new areas that are unexpected. Have at it. <laughs> I see some um, comments in the chat, by the way. I'm not able to look at that right now, but I'm hoping we'll have a couple moments to answer questions at the end. So I just want to acknowledge those it's chats. It's just me sharing resources. So you're okay. all good. Just making sure. Um, but here's, here's some things we can do as instructors. All of these slides, I wanna make clear too, all of these slides are pulled out of lectures that I actually do with the students. I'm very, very transparent about here are the skills I'm teaching you and I'll like catch myself. Hey, by the way, you know that lecture that we had the other day about like managing conflict? Look at me using the skills that we just talked about last week and here's how I'm applying them. We're constantly showing the students how we're doing that. That tends to help them as well. So we can help our students. If we realize that there is a conflict, we can help our students. But the key is we first have to be aware that there's a problem. Sometimes that's really easy and other times we have to wait until the students come to us. So that's a balancing act. You have to figure it out. Um, but helping the students to conceptualize what is the problem can then help with problem solving and strategizing. So sometimes what our students need um, and I teach juniors and seniors. So nominally they're sort of a little bit older or further along in their education, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't need the help. But certainly if you're teaching younger students just out of high school or kind of earlier in their education, they're gonna need more of this structure from us. So helping them to name the problem is the first step in problem solving because you can't fix something if you can't name it. Trying to, after we've conceptualized it, thinking about what are the behaviors that we desire to see? What are the outcomes? What is gonna look like a satisfactory resolution? Um, and we might facilitate that conversation like individually with a small group, or we might facilitate that conversation as a whole class. That has to be up to you. Um, coaching. I've never had to physically separate somebody in a classroom, but I did work in a psychiatric hospital. I have definitely had to physically separate people. Um, but again, I'm not going to go over all of these. I'm offering these to you as resources. How do we communicate effectively? I statements is the really big one there. Um, going back to referring to the contract that the students wrote at the beginning of the semester, Maybe we need to step in and discuss privately with an individual or as a group. Seeking supervision from higher ups for the students means coming to us. And here's the biggie. I have this as a whole class discussion somewhere mid semester and we have an open and honest, I name the elephant. If you have members who are not completing their tasks, do we put their name on the project? And we have a whole class discussion about that. That might not be comfortable for you. That might be something that you want to have small group by group. But again, this is a place where I find open, transparent conversation is the best. Now, the last handout that I have for you is an end of semester group evaluation. I'm going to be honest. I used it one semester and haven't used it again, but I included it for your consideration. I haven't used it again because I didn't think it was useful. I got overly rosy feedback that wasn't really realistic but I included it in your handouts because sometimes the accountability of knowing that you're going to be rated at the end of the semester by your peers is enough to help motivate people. 
So that's what I've got. And I've surprised myself by getting it done in 15 minutes. If you're having a group situation where you'd like to troubleshoot, please feel free to reach out. Email is the best, but feel free to reach out and chat with me and we can troubleshoot this because honestly, like I do this professionally and I'd be happy to help think about what would be useful. And that, my friends, is my 15 minutes. Perfect. Um, I am going to stop recording and then um, we can have a couple questions if anybody has them. But otherwise, uh, in and out is the goal here. So feel free to uh, to head on to your next thing.